All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Church in the Mall. Welcome home. For those of you that have joined us here in the space today, we are delighted. This is our second week that we've been open, and we are certainly working out some of the kinks. For those of you that are joining us online, we just thank you so much for being a part of the Church in the Mall community, and we look forward to the day in which we can all be reunited together. Hey, let's begin our service just in prayer and allow God to come and enter into this space and this time with us. Lord Jesus, as we gather here, uh, whether it be in this space or in our homes, Father, would you come and just make yourself present with us? Would you calm all the distractions that are going on in our lives right now, whether they be thoughts or concerns, whether they be just the noises of everyday life, or maybe even looking around that home and thinking of all the things that you need to get done for this weekend before the week starts? Father, would you just come and fill us? Allow us just to take a moment and breathe in your spirit. Would you come and make yourself known in our souls? God, I ask you to hear the desires of our hearts, to hear those thoughts in our minds, to bring us peace, reminding us of how loved we are by you, and that no matter what we face, you will face it with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those of you that are at home, today we are doing a brand new experiment. We're going to be doing communion here in the space. So if you haven't already, I want you to grab some elements, maybe a piece of bread or or a cookie, maybe grab that cup of coffee or some juice, something to get ready, because at the end of the service, we're going to do some communion together and be one in God's body. For the rest of you, you've been handed juice boxes and you've been given a bag of animal crackers. Uh, If you sit within a family, that bag is meant to be shared by everyone, but each person gets their own juice box. And so hold on to those as much as you may want to snack on them right now. We're going to get to that in just a minute in in our service. But we are in the midst of this incredible, incredible letter by Paul to this group of people called the Ephesians, which really isn't so much a church or or even a group, as much as it is an entire area. And this area is rather large, and this letter was meant to be circulated, and it's one of the most profound letters Paul writes because it captures a huge piece of Paul's theology, which is simply this, that there is an amazing mystery God has presented from the beginning of time that he has held in secret. But our God is not a God of secrets. Our God is a God who reveals things in the right time. And so at the appointed time, the time of Christ, coming into this world, the anointed one who would become the Messiah. As he gives his life uh, in total obedience and honor to God the Father, he becomes this perfect sacrifice, a lamb that is unblemished, and he becomes the ultimate atoning sacrifice for us, meaning that when he goes to the cross and takes on the wrath of God against all the injustice, all the evil, all the transgressions, all the sins of the world, he does it until it's finished so that there's nothing left for you and I, so that you and I don't have to keep going to the altar every year or month after month. We can go simply to Christ who takes us before the throne of God, and we are now co-heirs with Christ. Now, the great mystery of this is that this wasn't just for the Jews. In fact, the Jews were meant to be a chosen group of people, not so much for salvation, but were meant to be the tools or, or the... Um, Oh, I don't know, God's plan just unfolds in this man named Abraham who then it's designed to go forth into the peoples of the world as they grow into mighty nations and invite others into this kingdom of God. So that one day, this anointed one, this Messiah Christ, would reign over the heavenly realms and the earthly realms, bringing all things into one. Now, as Paul is explaining this, he he hits hard, especially in chapter 3, which is where we're going to be today, this idea that Gentiles are now grafted in a part of that same promise made to the Jews, and so that all Gentiles are allowed and invited and brought in to experience the risen Christ in their lives. And so the truth of the matter is most of us in this space today and those of us watching at home know Jesus Christ and are invited into his family because we were Gentiles that are now a part of this great mystery. We get to be a part of the great promise of God. And so before we go recap, if you haven't already, grab your Bibles. You can flip to chapter 3, but let me just walk through chapter 1 and 2 real quick. Chapter 1, Paul begins this great letter not telling us who we were, but who we are that you and I are children of the living God. We've been invited in. He wanted us. He loved us. He chose us. And that's a very special word Paul uses. Paul chose you and I before the earth even began to be formed. 
And so you think about this idea of God's love transcending time, that God wants a relationship with you. And therefore, he makes a way, and so we now become co-heirs with Christ, children of the living God, and that's chapter 1. Now he goes into chapter 2, and he says, now, now that you have Christ, let me tell you who you were. You were children just being blown around this world under a different ownership, under a different family. And he talks about that family being the prince of the air, or as we come to know him as Satan, or Lucifer, or the evil one, um, the deceiver. And the idea is that as children of the world, we're stuck in this paradigm. We can't change our outcome or our situation. We are children of wrath. But thanks to Jesus Christ, who comes in and breaks those bounds, breaks those chains, and invites us into this relationship with God the Father, you and I now have a way to approach God's throne boldly. And this is a huge piece of Paul's theology that we can stand before God face to face boldly because of Jesus Christ. There is no other belief system in the world that allows you to stand before God face to face. But we, as followers of Jesus Christ, have that opportunity. So now we begin chapter and it's probably the shortest, but it's also one of the thickest, uh, meatiest pieces of Paul's theology as he begins to explain things that I believe every Christian needs to not just know, but come to trust in and believe. So again, if you have your Bibles, let's jump into chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading through it quickly, but I'm going to be pointing out some key pieces that I think are so profound, and we're going to tie some of those pieces into the situations you and I are probably living in right now. And so, Let's begin in chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, All this exactly why I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Now, don't forget that this letter was written while Paul was in prison. Now, he's placed in prison in Rome. And if you remember, the end of Acts ends where he is uh, surviving. See, but he knows that God promised he would stand before Caesar. He makes his way to Rome. He's put in jail, mostly to be humiliated. But what ends up happening is people from all over Rome come and they have an audience with Paul. And again, the faith of Christ spreads through Rome. And so in this situation, Paul is stuck. He can't go anywhere. He's imprisoned, uh, trapped. And probably the same way I feel at times, especially during this pandemic, I feel trapped. I, I feel stuck. Sometimes I look at my own season of life and I think, boy, is it, is it going to get any better than this? Or is this all there is to offer and all there is to have? And maybe there's some of you that are looking at your own marriage that way, or maybe you're looking at your job that way, or maybe your own lot in life, or just the frustrations of things that are out of your control. And here is Paul living in a situation where things are out of his control. But what he does here is he begins to tell us that there's a theology of hardships that Paul is going to begin to explain to us in this chapter. Now, I have to tell you, as as a pastor... It's so embarrassing to have to tell you, but I struggle with believing in the theology of hardships. I don't like pain. In fact, I carry a little uh, silver vial on my keychain that if you were to open it, inside it is an extra supply of Tylenol because if I feel a headache or I feel pain coming on, I can take one of those and make it go away. Now, what I hate to tell you is that there's times in my own life that I'm wrestling with the things of this world or, or things that even have a deeper meaning and a spiritual meaning, and I want to just avoid the pain. And so I find ways to check out. And what Paul's going to tell us is this theology of pain, this theology of challenge, this theology of hardship is something that we all have to go through if we're going to grow as Christians. If you want to know God face to face, you have to walk through these situations of fire so that you can be purified in a way so that you can be prepared. And so what Paul is saying is you're going to face hardships. There are going to be all sorts of things that are just unfair and, and things that are out of your control, but hold fast because this is where God shows up. So he begins this saying, all this is exactly why I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Looking at his own circumstance, he flips it around saying, I'm not just a prisoner of this cell. Forget that. There's things much more bigger at foot here, things that are much larger going on around us. And I'm going to trust that God somehow has all this orchestrated together. Not that he caused it, but that he will not miss the opportunity to use something tragic, something difficult in our lives in order to grow us and sharpen us. And so he continues. 
outside nations. Paul says, listen, you've heard how bring you this message of grace and how this mystery was made known to me in Revelation. In other words, this mystery of God inviting the Gentiles into being a part of God's family, that all peoples of the world were designed to come together under the headship of Christ in the house of God, that we're all children of the living God. It's so beautiful. But as Paul wrote about it earlier, what you read, what you better able to understand the depth of my insight into this mystery of the anointed one, a mystery that has never before been shown to past generations, but now these secrets are being revealed to God's chosen emissaries. And the prophets talked about it through the Holy Spirit. And then he goes into what I think is one of the hearts of this whole piece. Check out this next part. He says, specifically, the mystery is this. By trusting in the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has come to provide that anointing sacrifice to become the savior of not just the Jews, but the entire world, the good news, the Gentile outsiders are now becoming fully enfranchised members. They're being brought into the group of the same body, heirs alongside Israel, and beneficiaries of the promise that has been fulfilled through Jesus the anointed. Now, Paul talks about that mystery. Now he's going to talk about why he's purposely been called into this. And what I think is going on here is more than just Paul saying he's called into it. He's saying anyone who has accepted the grace of Jesus Christ in their life is called into this next purpose. So I want you to listen because this is the piece that helps to define who we are. And the reason for that is because this idea of grace, if you receive grace, it means that you're now being taken into the service of grace. That's why when we receive grace, we give grace. It's so important that Jesus will bring up earlier in the Gospels, he'll say, you know, when it comes to being forgiven, you'll be forgiven as much as you forgive. And what Jesus is really laying in here is the idea of do you fully understand the weight and the measure in which God is giving us grace? And Paul, quite frankly, will answer it this way. He'll say the unmeasurable aspects of God's grace. It's so much I can't even fathom it, but what I know is I'm now an emissary, somebody who brings forth this kingship of Christ and the message of grace to the world. And so about us. Paul is saying, I became a servant and a preacher of this gospel. By the gift of God's grace, as it was exercised, his amazing power over me, I cannot think of anyone more unworthy to this cause than I, the least of these, a sinner of the saints. You know, Paul constantly wrestled with this idea that as somebody who once persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, he was unworthy to receive the grace of God. But somehow by the grace of God, by God choosing to love him in spite of himself, Christ comes and reveals himself to him, and Paul is chosen to be in the family of God, not because of his skill set, but because of just him being loved by God. So I need you to hear this, and especially you at home, I need you to hear this, that God has not chosen you because you have something to offer. God has chosen you because he loves you. And from the beginning of the world, even before it began, he chose you to be with him in Christ. Let's continue because this next part is where he begins to understand and and explain in a deeper aspect of what it is to be filled with God's grace. This is something that I find so amazing yet so challenging. Because as I go through these difficult times, this theology of grace, this theology of going through hard times in order to experience God... I just don't like it because I've told you before, I don't like the pain, but there's something about being in the midst of that fire that God shows up and invites us in. So Paul says, here to be an echo of the voice and a preacher to all the nations and the riches of the anointed one, riches that no one can ever even imagine. I'm privileged I understand God's grace in such a way that I will never forget how much God has forgiven me. And therefore, there is no one and no situation I can ever enter into that won't allow me or rob me of extending that same amount of grace, an unfathomable amount. Do you ever think that sometimes these hard situations are just simply opportunities for us to experience something new in God? 
that maybe he wants to begin shaping and molding and, and maybe even chipping off pieces so that you and I can be presented as these amazing trophies of God's grace that Paul talks about in chapter 2. I'm going to give you uh, an example that I think is um, very telling of me in my own heart, but also how God has shown up for me this week. I was invited to be a part of a cluster group of pastors. So, yeah, being a United Methodist pastor, we are in a connectional ministry, meaning that we uh, share life together as pastors. We share ministry resources. We share life. We have a great opportunity to just come together and we can share experiences and frustrations. And it's supposed to be a very life-giving group. But I have to tell you, the group that I've been assigned is not one that I was excited about. In fact, there's some people in that group that I, I struggle with, um, people that I've struggled with for years. And so God sent me an email. Well, somebody sent me an email, but God talked to me while I'm reading this email saying, hey, you're going to meet on this particular day at this time at this church, and you're going to meet with this cluster group. And I thought, well, close. You almost had me, God. And I deleted the email. And then all week long, I kept thinking about how I, I really should show up for that cluster group, but the truth of the matter is I just don't want to. I don't like some of those people. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And then they have spent a whole part of my life working at this last year, trying hard to help pull them out of the grave, and they chose to die. And I was frustrated with that church. And so here I am meeting with a group of people that I don't necessarily like at a location that I don't necessarily like, and I'm thinking, boy, this is more pain than I can handle, God. I'm not going. Later that day, I found myself driving towards that location. But lucky for me, there's a gas station on 79 right before it so I could pull in there, and even though I only needed two gallons of gas, I filled up anyway. I tried to find things to do just so I didn't have to go there. So I went in to buy a drink, and I just kind of putzed around, and I'm looking at the clock, and in the back of my mind, I hear God saying, Kevin, I, I really want you to go to this. And I thought, well, I don't want to. So then I got towards the church, and I drove right past the church into the parking lot next door. And I parked there, and I said, well, God, this is about as close as I'm going to get today. And then I heard God say, Kevin, I want you to go to this church. And I banged on my steering wheel and I said, God, I don't want to go. It's painful for me. And do you know what I heard God say? I know. After I don't know how much time it took, I got the courage to drive over there and it's now one o'clock when we're all supposed to meet. And do you think anyone's there? Nope, just me. So now I'm embarrassed to have to get out of my car, put my chair out, and sit there and wait for all these people to show up. But I do it. And I'm waiting, and I don't see anyone, and you know what I said? See, God, I told you. I don't want to be here. Within the next five minutes, everyone showed up. All these different pastors from all these different churches, and we sat down, and we began the usual thing that happens in these situations. It's a bitch fest. People begin complaining about all the things that are going wrong in life and ministry and how hard it is doing this during COVID. And I'm sitting there journaling and writing notes and things that are probably very inappropriate in any situation, and I'm just frustrated. And all of a sudden, I heard God say, Kevin, isn't this great that there are no rules right now in church, that you can do anything you want? tell him that. So I kind of waited for the lull in the conversation. I just said, hey, isn't it great that there are no rules in church right now because of this COVID thing? People are doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Half the churches I know are doing drive-in services where you can drive into the parking lot and tune in on the radio to hear the message and you can see it unfold before you. 63% of United Methodist churches that have never been online before are now online showing their sermons to people. Some people are still coming together in small groups are growing all over the place and people's faith is growing deeper. Isn't it amazing how God has come up with all these opportunities for us to share life together and to experience him in a whole new way all because of this COVID thing? And the most amazing thing happened. We spent the next hour and a half talking about all the good things God is doing in our lives. Now, when it was time to leave, I have to tell you that something radical had begun to happen in my heart. 
one of the pastors there that I really just honestly wrestle with. I just don't have a lot of respect for them. My heart began to change. And it was as if God was saying, you know what, Kevin, you don't get to choose the people. You would choose them by skill. You would choose them by personality. You would choose them by who you think is good. But I, the Lord your God, chooses people because I love them. And for those who enjoy and engage with me back, they will see my glory and my wonder unfold before them. That one particular pastor that really frustrated me, she's doing an outside worship service. And do you know what happened this last week? Cars drove in off the highway to come and be a part of that service. How can I deny the power of God working in her life and her church? Isn't that amazing? But what I'm telling you is in this theology of hardships, this is where God begins taking what's really hard, not the situation, but our hearts, and he begins transforming them and softening them and preparing us for what he's going to do next. And so, my friends, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have lots of hard situations, and here's my encouragement to you, and this is what I'm trying to practice in my own life. Step into them. Step boldly into them because you and I stand boldly before God face to face. You wonder where God is? He's in the midst of these troubled situations. He's in the midst of the most difficult things you can face. And he's waiting for you to come and join him there so that he can begin transforming your life. You know, so often I pray for other people and I forget to pray for my own heart to change, my own soul to be enraptured with God, my my own life to bear witness. But my friends, the most difficult things you and I face are really those opportunities where God reveals himself and does miracles in our midst. You know, the miracle is I had told my district superintendent a little over a year ago that I would never work with that pastor ever again. But the other day I'm sitting there going, you know, God, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something you're doing in my life where I need to change and and my heart is beginning to soften towards this other pastor. And I'm seeing the way that you're working in their lives. You know, God, glory be to you. And in the same way, Paul is telling us that almost exact same message. Yeah, I'm in prison. Yeah, my life is not my own anymore. I'm I'm a prisoner, if you will. But let me tell you, above and beyond all this, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so this idea is that we're aware of something far larger than just our circumstance. That our circumstance doesn't define us, but the God of our lives defines us. And he meets us in the midst and he begins transforming us and shaping us and making us whole. It's amazing to me. I want to read this last part to you because I think this wraps the whole piece up. And this is the part that makes it where you and I can't just walk away from it. We have an opportunity to engage God on a level that is truly transformative. And let me read this to you. It's, again, we're in Ephesians 3. And I want you to pick up in verse 10. Where Paul's saying, listen, I'm a grace-made man. I, I, I've been grabbed hold of grace, which means I now have to administer grace. And so he said, listen, here's, here's the final objective. Here's God's purpose through the church. He intends now to make known his infinite and boundless wisdom all rulers, to all rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. When Paul is saying this, he's not talking about just before God and angels. He's talking about the spiritual places. The places in which evil has taken over this world. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about where we just see things that aren't fair. I'm talking about the kind of evil that corrupts from the inside out. The kind of evil that's constantly seeking to rob us of our joy. The kind of evil that's trying to rob us of our own souls. And what Paul is saying here is, listen... When we take a stand in the situations that we're dealing with, when we step into them and we allow God's grace to be God's grace, not only are we transformed, but evil is put back in its rightful place and it has to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what it did. You know, this week I felt like Christ became more my Lord than he's been in a long time. He took a key area of my life and he began to show his lordship and take that evil and make it go into submission. 
But that doesn't happen unless we step into those difficult situations, unless we have those difficult conversations, unless we walk in and say, you know what, God, here I am. I, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to see what you're going to do next. And so I'm going to ask you to do a couple things this week. Number one, I'm going to ask that you pray and say, God, here's some of the hard situations I'm dealing with. Enter into them with me. I know you may be like me and you may find every gas station or every driveway or every other opportunity to try to escape it, but at some point I want you to just say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to show up and I'm going to step into this. And when you do, once you're there, I want you to then just listen. God, what do you want me to do here? You know, that's why I think Paul was so effective is he was so good at listening to what God was saying. I really don't think Paul had a lot of great skills. What he had was faithfulness. And every time he showed up, God gave him the words. He gave him the feelings, the actions, the soft heart. But don't forget, you've been given the keys to heaven. You've been given the grace of God. You're called children of the living God. The way we're going to transform this world is by showing evil that it has no place in our lives. When we engage with one another and we allow Christ to be at the center of it, we can work through things and our hearts can soften and we become transformed. You know, the gospel of grace is all about being transformed. Speaking about transformation, I want you to grab your juice box Open your bag of animal crackers and make sure that everyone at your table has one. For you at home, would you please grab your elements? Because when we talk about the idea of transformation, one of the great images we have in the church is communion. It's meant to be an image of Christ's body broken for us. Typically, you'll see me take a loaf of bread and I break it in half and I say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Every time you take and eat of it, do so in remembrance of Christ. Today, you're going to take your animal cracker or whatever you have at home. You're going to hold it up and say, God, would you consecrate this for your good works? And Jesus, I accept what you've done for me. Break that piece of cracker or bread or whatever it is you have. Put it in your mouth and be thankful for what Christ has done for you. Now, for those of you in the space, grab your juice box. Make sure you put your straw in it. For those of you at home, grab something to drink. And as you take that juice box, that drink, go ahead and just hold it out in front of you. Again, God, consecrate this for your good purposes. Use this in my life as a reminder of your great love for me. And in chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul talks about God's love and grace, the blood of Christ being poured over us like chocolate being drizzled on a Sunday, just covering it. It's this idea of just God's grace overflowing our lives. And so as you take a drink, I want you to think about how God is constantly refreshing us and washing over us, providing that life drink for us. That just like the grapes were crushed, so his body was crushed. As we do so, we do so in remembrance of him. Now, for those of you that are at home or for those of you that feel comfortable at your table sitting with your family members or dear friends, if you feel comfortable, why don't you go ahead and just grab their hand next to you. Just grab a hand of the person next to you if you feel comfortable. If not, go ahead and just put your hands here. It's okay. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, but I do think there's something special about the community coming together. And so for those of you at home, go ahead and just grab hands of that person next to you, those in this space. I want you to close your eyes and I want you just to take a moment and I want you just to think of the face of Christ. Just let your mind just go blank for a minute. Invite Jesus to just reveal his face to you for a second. Now what I want you to do is not talk to Jesus. I want you just to sit there in his presence for just a moment. And I want you just to listen to what it is he might say to you. 
I want you to know that whenever Jesus speaks, he only speaks encouragement. He never shames. He never beats up. He never humiliates. I also notice Jesus never says a lot. He only says what I need to hear. And so go ahead and ask him right now in the comfortableness of your heart with those people that are near you that you love and just, Jesus, what do you want to say to me today? Some of you, you may be thinking of some of those difficult situations. Maybe this is the time to say, Jesus, what do you want me to do about this situation? Do I need to make a phone call? Do I need to go meet with somebody? Do I need to pay something back? Do I need to try to right a wrong? Were feelings hurt in a situation that I need to try to make right? Just allow him to speak to you for a minute. Those words that he's saying to you, those are for you. Those are the things that he wants you to know right now. Let me pray a blessing over us as we conclude our time together. Lord Jesus, in the comfort of those that we love, in the comfort of knowing you love us, we simply extend the knowledge of knowing that you have given us an infinite amount of grace. And that grace becomes the tool and the vessel in which we can enter into any difficult situation, that we become men and women of grace, filled with grace in such a way that now we are ambassadors of it. We get to share it. And in doing so, we don't just simply change the lives around us. We end up finding our own hearts softening in the midst. Jesus, you promised to finish what you started, and so we take that and hold it tight. And we hold you accountable to finish what you started in us. Continue to reveal your good mercies to us. Teach us your ways. Walk with us that we might feel your presence in all situations and make us more than conquerors. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. My friends, before we conclude our service, I just want to remind you that we are, in fact, on a journey. Not so much trying to simply resurrect our church and figuring out how we fit into this COVID-19 situation, but we're looking at what is God calling us to do over this next season. We don't know how long this silly virus is going to be here, but what we do know is that God's grace and mercy and his purpose for the church still stand strong. And so we need your help. Not only do we need you to tune in, but to share with likes, to be able to share these posts online. We need those of you that come on Sunday to continually invite people to see who feels comfortable and confident. We also need you to think about giving to this church. We can't do ministry without financial help. It's just the reality. In order for us to continue the ministries here at Church in the Mall, in order for us to live into this new season of church where we're beginning to do more and more stuff online and we're learning how to better connect with families and children and individuals that can't quite make it here, we need your help. And so if you would please consider making a donation to Church in the Mall, whether it's a regular gift and tithe, you know, my wife and I, we always give 10%. That's just something we feel is important. And we would never ask somebody here to do something that we didn't feel like we could do too. For those of you that feel like you can just do a one-time gift, this would be your time. This is the opportunity for us to begin to explore and look at what God is doing. We're taking a look at a lot of people that still want to become members of this church, and we're looking at doing a membership Sunday. We're also looking at the opportunity of baptism because we have people that want to be baptized, and we're trying to figure out how we can best do that. But we're seeing lives changed, and you are a part of that with us. So if you could consider being a part of a financial support to this church, 
I promise you it won't come back void. That God will use it to continue the ministries here and do even more great good in this community. All right, my friends, go in God's peace and God's grace. We look forward to seeing you next week online. For those of you in this space, we're so glad you're here. If you want to be a part of a small group, there are links that can be found on our page. Uh, For those of you here, there's links that you can find as well. Send us a message. We'll be happy to set you up with a small group and better connect people uh, for fellowship and for spiritual growth. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.